Thank you, everyone. I, I know there's a risk in being the person that makes the last call, but I'm going to go with it anyway. So, um, We'll have a few people trickling in, but I do want to get started. We have a full program tonight. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for International Trade and Transportation here at Cal State Long Beach. I am also the Associate Director for Long Beach Programs for the Metrans Transportation Center. Metrans is a university transportation partnership between USC and Cal State Long Beach. And on behalf of President Jane Close Connolly and Associate Vice President for International Education and my Dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Education, Jeet Joshi, I am pleased to welcome you to our campus and to the 17th CITT State of the Trade and Transportation Industry Town Hall meeting. Since our first town hall in unbelievably 1999, our goal has been to provide a forum in which to explore a key issue challenging the goods movement industry and the many stakeholders who are in some way connected to that industry. Over these many years, we've tackled such topics as the environment, productivity, security, and many others, and we've strived to address these issues of common concern and interest to our community in a respectful way and in the spirit of education. This year's theme is 20 years of goods movement in Southern California, how we got here and where we're going. And of course, this theme is by design. This year marks the 20th anniversary of CITT, which was launched along with the Global Logistics Specialist Program in 1997. Over the past 20 years, GLS has become the cornerstone program of our center, which has grown to include other, what we think are innovative education and training programs like the Marine Terminal Operations Professional Program, along with a broad research agenda in the area of logistics and workforce development, and a number of community engagement activities like this one, the Town Hall. CITT has grown alongside and because of the growth in international trade and the local trade sector. We have always enjoyed strong partnerships with so many of you in this room, and I'd like to recognize a few special guests tonight. We exist first and foremost because of our students, um, many of whom uh, came here for a reunion photo tonight. Uh, and I'd like to welcome the students, graduates, and instructors, instructors from the Global Logistics Specialist Program, the Marine Terminal Operations Professional Program, the Master of Arts in Global Logistics, and Masters of Science in Supply Chain Management and all of our programs. So many thanks to you all and the students in the room. Uh, a big thank you to our dedicated instructors and professors. Thank you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to recognize um, the elected officials and dignitaries and in, in audience here tonight. Uh, please hold your applause until I finish reading their names. Um, these are in no particular order. Um, former Assemblymember Bonnie Lowenthal, Long Beach Harbor Commissioners Rich Dines, Luann Bynum, and Doug Drummond. Uh, from the office of Senator Dianne Feinstein, we have Chris Barwick. Um, Iransu Pujadas from Congressman Alan Lowenthal's office. And from the office of State Senator Ricardo Lara, we have uh, Julia Juarez, Tanya Martin, and Alina Wilbro Benson. And I'm very pleased to welcome Kim Cha Hoot, the Honorary Consul General of Cambodia. So thank you and welcome to you all. Yeah. Of course, an, an assembly member, Patrick O'Donnell, will be part of the, 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 the uh, discussion later tonight. So thank you as well, assembly member. Um, representing the International Longshore and Warehouse Union are um, Vice President Mike Trudeau of Local 13. And we're also uh, pleased to welcome incoming President Mark Mendoza. Um, we have, uh, uh, on behalf of, uh, sorry, on behalf of uh, President Danny Miranda, Mike Trudeau, President Paul Traney of Local 63, who will also be taking part uh, in our panel. Um, my apologies if I missed someone. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors who make sure we can keep this event free of charge and open to the public. These include our principal funders for all METRANS projects, the U.S. Department of Transportation and Caltrans, and our Town Hall 2017 sponsors, Watson Land Company, BNSF Railway, and the LA Customs Brokers and Freight Forwarders Association. And our METRANS Associates, the Associates program provides the core support for METRANS. Um, as you all know, we cannot survive on grant funding alone, so we truly appreciate the support of our associate members, and they include the Port of Long Beach, the Port of Los Angeles, 
Southern California Association of Governments, uh, LA Metro, Aerospace, Ceres uh, YTI terminals, Majestic Realty, Foothill Transit, and the ILWU. There's one last group which guides the development of our program each and every year, and that's the CITT Policy and Steering Committee. Their names are listed on the program, and I'd like you to help me recognize them and thank them for making this night possible as well. They represent all segments of our industry and community, and we couldn't do what we do at CITT without their assistance, so thank you. Uh, there's one name on that list of policy and steering committee members um, who was instrumental in the development of CITT and the town hall and making sure that the ILWU was at the table from the beginning, and that's Dominic Moretti. In fact, the town halls began life as the ILWU state of the trade and transportation town hall. Dominic passed away in February of last year, and it's a tremendous loss. Dominic was something of a waterfront renaissance man, um, he was a proud longshoreman and proud graduate of Cal State Long Beach, uh, where he received both his bachelor's and his master's. Um, he also received his PhD from UCLA. He split his days on the docks, first as a member of Local 13 and then as a shipping clerk for Local 63, with time spent in the classroom as a teacher at Dodson Junior High, and as Dr. Moretti, a professor at East Los Angeles College, where he helped to establish the international trade program. He was passionate about education understanding that there was something new to learn about this industry, no matter how long you had worked in it or lived in its shadow. And he was my own personal instructor as well. He fought furiously but good-naturedly and with a quiet confidence to bridge the gap between dock worker and terminal operator, industry and community, and perhaps most important to us at CITT, the industry and the university. What I will always remember him for is his favorite quote, which has become the unofficial mission of CITT. Bring the university to the docks and the docks to the university. At the conclusion of tonight's town hall, uh, which will, will end in, a, in approximately two hours, we'll be conferring the first Dominic Moretti Award, which the Policy and Steering Committee has created to recognize someone who has helped to foster partnerships along the supply chain, facilitate dialogue, and has demonstrated long-term dedication to the industry and earned the respect of a wide variety of stakeholders. It will be, we hope, a fitting way to remember him on an annual basis and remind us of our core mission. And we're thrilled that Norman Fassler Katz is our first recipient. You'll get a chance to hear from him later when Marianne Gastelum uh, presents him with the Moretti Award. Um, now on to what Dominic would want us to focus on, the town hall. Tonight's agenda is in your program. We're taking advantage of the 20th anniversary to make the first part of the evening a bit of a retrospective. We'll begin with a video, which as always is produced by Dave Kelly of Advanced Media Production and his team. Um, they're housed here at the College of Continuing and Professional Education at Cal State Long Beach. For those of you who have seen our town hall videos, um, this one is a bit different. We wanted to document some of our history revisit some of the topics we addressed in prior town halls, which it's, 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 it's interesting to note, if you look at our 1999 and 2001 town hall agendas, one of the topics in discussion was um, the announcement by the China Shipping Group of an amazingly large 9800 TEU vessel. Um, and also um, Hanjin's agreement in uh, in uh, the late 1999, uh, I'm sorry, 2001, for the largest terminal to be built at the port of Long Beach. So, and I'm sure Hanjin may come up tonight uh, in the discussion. Um, but in the video, we also want to turn the camera on some of the people from industry, labor, and the community who have been part of this journey with us for the past 20 years. We did this for not only this particular audience tonight, but also for others not in attendance, and those perhaps who are not as familiar with our story. In the video, I get the opportunity to interview Marianne Gastelum, um, whom you all know as CITT's founding executive director, and uh, are in, in many ways our institutional memory. Um, she tells some of the story of the center's growth and its founding. Think Oprah and Tom Cruise, but without all the couch jumping. Um, there's, there's no need for that. We know, everyone here in this room knows that true exuberance comes from spending two hours talking about chassis and turn times. 
After this 20-minute video, Paul Bingham, the Vice President of Trade and Logistics for the EDR Group, will take the stage. Um, if the video is the ghost of town halls past, Paul will focus on the present. He'll give us a brief presentation on the state of global trade today, and he also will serve as the bridge to the future, because after his presentation, Paul will assemble our distinguished panel to discuss the future of goods movement in the region. And he's the right person. Paul played the same role at the 2009 town hall when we looked at the decade ahead. Well, that future is here now. And Paul will even have occasion to look at some of the predictions made then and discuss with our panel what we got right, what we got wrong, and why. And of course, what it all means moving forward. And then we'll conclude with the presentation of the Moretti Award, as I mentioned. The format and guidelines for the public Q&A portion are included in your program. Uh, we ask that you please keep questions to the point and on topic, no multiple part questions, and we, and we ask that you're careful to keep it to questions instead of commentary. Um, you can ask questions by either submitting a card to one of the ushers um, or uh, by raising your hand if you'd prefer to ask for the mic from your, from your seat. With that, uh, let's watch the video and we'll start the, the 2017 CITT Town Hall. Thank you. Welcome to this special celebration of the first 20 years of the Center for International Trade and Transportation at California State University, Long Beach. I'm Tom O'Brien, the Executive Director of CITT, and I'm joined here today by Marianne veneris Castellum, who is the Founding Executive Director of CITT and currently serves as our Special Advisor and External Liaison. So Marianne, welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for having me, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Um, I want to turn back the clock to the mid-1990s when there wasn't a wide array of logistics training programs, uh, but you saw an opportunity for the university to play a role, a role that has since expanded to include research and education and community-wide engagement. Um, what was it about that time and how did, how did uh, CITT play a role? Well, Tom, it was actually the industry that approached us uh, and wanted us to help them address a lack in training opportunities for the logistics industry, for transportation and goods movement, and for the various segments um, individually as well as for the entire supply chain. Uh, out of that came a year-long process uh, of developing the curriculum, and for that we brought in industry leaders, industry mm -hmm. experts. Um, we also used that here to identify folks who could teach in the program. Those are people who walk the talk. Uh, pretty soon um, we developed a very unique professional designation program, the Global Logistics Specialist Program. Mm -hmm. Uh, that people could earn after completing all the very vigorous segments of the program. We had students from various backgrounds, um, industry experience, uh, community experience, and um, pretty soon those students helped us to um, make this an internationally known right. program. And uh, this resulted actually in franchising the program um, up to Northern California as well as China. It was exciting, I remember that. It was that. very exciting, well, yes. What was it about the, the nature of the university, sort of as a, as a neutral forum, that allowed it to play this unique role with, with uh, partners in industry? Actually, it was the industry that approached us, and the industry uh, wanted us to help them to address a lack of training opportunities for the goods movement, mm -hmm modes and segments individually and for the entire supply chain as a whole. Um, what they envisioned is for a place where all the industry stakeholders can come together. Um, they can look at the issues, the challenges that mm -hmm. face the industry, uh, jointly address them, share expertise in bringing about solutions. So the folks that we wanted to bring together is not only the industry segments, but also uh, the Port Authority as well as uh, community representatives. 
And labor, of course. Which and was, labor, of course, which yes. Which was unique for Absolutely. the time. Absolutely, yes. And I think that the, the Policy and Steering Committee, which was sort of the outgrowth of that effort and which exists to today, um, plays such a critical role That's as, right. a, as a, a place where these discussions can take place in the spirit of, of education. And I know that uh, given the, the unique uh, relationship that we've had with individuals in the classroom and with our external partners, uh, we have a few comments from them now that we'd like to share with you. Uh, my experience has been a very positive one, albeit on the educational side of CITT as an instructor, but the organization is much more than that. Trade advocacy, reaching out to the community, preparing youngsters in high school to transition into careers in international trade. So I think when you look at the organization from an educational perspective, advocacy perspective, and just a general good corporate citizen, there, there's none better in Southern California. It's important um, to me to be involved in the CITT Policy and Steering Committee because I'm able to represent the BCO community through my partnership with the Institute for Supply Management. And the, um, the BCOs are a huge group of companies. There's not just one company, not just one big box retailer that represents the BCOs. And so this gives us a voice and it gives us a chance to be involved in the supply chain optimization groups as well. CITT is an invaluable tool for the entire Southern California region. When we look at our decision-making bodies, whether it's the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of Long Beach, SCAG, Metro, um, the Alameda Corridor Transportation Authority, the policy and research that comes through CITT helps to guide sound and good public policy. Two, from a jobs perspective, we know the students that are coming through CITT are the best of the best. They're well-trained. They receive a sound education and background. And that's important because one out of every nine jobs in the region is connected to the goods and freight movement industry. Metrans and CITT have been doing research for now close to 20 years that has really grown in its reputation and in its respect uh, at both the federal and, and state policy levels. Um, at, as a result, Metrans and CITT have had significant influence on federal policy and now on state policy in implementing the California State Sustainable Freight Action Plan. I think overall it's been quite positive. I think you can look at various people in management positions, whether it be in the steamship industry, in the terminal management side, in the logistics and third party provider side, as well as the importers and exporters. All of them have benefited from uh, the continued professionalism and education that uh, you know, the GLS and the CITT program offer. The value of the town hall is that the ILWU has a venue where its members and family can come and uh, get some education on what is going on in the industry. But this is given from the university's perspective that is very transparent and uh, you know, very trustworthy. And it, it's not uh, given from the opinions or views of other stakeholders in the industry. Uh, that may have uh, their own best interests at heart. So I, I believe that uh, the ILW has benefited tremendously from having this annual event where we can learn about uh, what has happened in the past year and what we can expect in the next year. You know, Mary, one of the other things that was occurring around the time of the development of, of GLS and the launch of CITT was another important partnership. Uh, with both Cal State Long Beach and the Center for International Trade and Transportation. And that's our partnership with the University of Southern California in the Metrans Transportation yes. Center. Uh, it's a university transportation center which now has extended our reach through partnerships with universities in, uh, in Arizona and Nevada and, and Hawaii as well. It's, it's exciting. Yes. Um, and it, it, it's been an important part of the, of the CITT story because it's, um, it's allowed us to do things that we couldn't have done otherwise as a center because of the Absolutely. administrative support and the financial support. Yes. And, and perhaps the most important of those activities is what CITT is most known for, and that's the state of the trade and transportation town hall meetings, the annual right. town halls, yes. um, which provided us an opportunity to bring the community and industry and um, everyone who's interested in good, goods movement into the same room to discuss important issues. Um, you were there at the beginning. How did those meetings come about? 
Well, the uh, first annual, annual state of the trade and transportation industry was actually staged under the motto of intermodal transportation, mm. uh, future growth, and global connectivity. And this was the motto for all our town halls, I should add. Our goal was to bring the most precise issues that affect the industry mm. at a given time uh, to the audience, to the industry, and particularly to the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. The rank and file is what we wanted to bring to the campus uh, to hear the information, the forces that impact their industry. And, and that happens a lot now, but I don't think that was the case at the time. Um, no, it was not. Um, I remember the topics that we focused on range from uh, technology, competition, um, um, environment, regulation, and, and of course, quality of life. And, and I think one of the things that both of us are, are really proud of is the impact it's had as an educational yes. endeavor. Um, we've produced videos for each of the town halls um, that have allowed us to extend the discussion beyond that particular evening into classrooms and boardrooms after the fact. Um, some of those videos were award-winning, Yes, you recall. they were, yes. And we actually have a few clips that we'd like to share with you now. The agreement was forged with the work and sweat of many people from both management and labor. But two leaders proved to be visionaries, working with mutual respect and trust. We, we had great leaders in Paul St. Truer and Harry Bridges. I mean, this would never have come, out, come about without those two fellows. Industrialization and fast-paced development are continuing a 40-year expansion trend in the Asian sector of the Pacific Rim. In California, robust international trade continues to power the engine of the state's economy. Southern California's ports handle steady growth in goods movement. World trade generates about 320,000 jobs for California. In the Southland, trade affects one of every seven jobs. Cargo is the lifeblood of the region. As many as 50 ships anchored in the water. No movement for days at a time. Some ships taking 10 days to unload. Not enough freight trains. Retailers waiting anxiously. Delivery costs going up. Merchandise not getting to the market. Consumers finding shelves empty. Demand for goods continuing to increase. Is this a preview of things to come? Will Southern California suffer perennially with inefficient goods movement when growth doubles and triples in the years ahead? After more than five years beyond the terrorist attacks of 9-11, numerous actions have been taken to address issues about national security and safety. America's seaports have been identified as significant potential targets. High on the list is the San Pedro Bay in Southern California, a large population base in the surrounding area where approximately 40% of the nation's imports arrive provides a compelling reason for concern. The local ports, in effect, serve as America's front door for goods entering the country. Economic trends, including a global credit crisis, fluctuation in oil prices, and fears of a steep worldwide recession have contributed to this decline. And now there is more competition for delivery routes. The next decade promises a fight for discretionary cargo. The regional population may grow, but the consumers east of the Rockies could find their goods delivered through a variety of routes and methods in competition with West Coast ports in general and the LA Long Beach Harbor in particular. You know, Marianne, we've spent a lot of time talking about the past, which is good. There's been a lot to talk about, including the town halls. Um, but really, we want the focus to be on the future, on the next 20 years. And uh, I expect that it's going to be like the last 20 years where we're trying to respond to what is a very dynamic and often changing industry. You're absolutely right, Tom. Our focus is and will be always on the future as far as our training is concerned, but also our research and our industry forums like the International Open Freight Conference and our 
uh, community outreach activities. As you know, and as you said, it's not always easy to predict what is coming down the pipe, what is going on in the future. We deal with an international industry. We deal with uh, many competitors and many different forces. But we watch these, and we act accordingly. Right. I, I see that in the, in the future, I think that we'll be looking at what's driving the interests of the industry, which is, as always, that need to balance environmental sustainability, um, uh, economic competitiveness for the region, and efficiency of the freight sector. Sorry. And it's some of the topics that we've ad uh, addressed in town halls in the past in videos, and we'll like to show a clip from one of those now. The goods movement industry in Southern California is the engine of prosperity for the entire region. With 14 million TEUs traveling through the system annually, the high volume of cargo has provided a steady flow of economic activity and a constant source of good paying jobs. This commanding performance by the Twin Port Harbor Complex is even more impressive when considering it has occurred while adapting to a densely populated, high traffic area with the most stringent air quality environmental standards in the nation. Now, however, competition from other ports, including those in Canada, and new possibilities through the Suez Canal and the expanded Panama Canal have made it imperative for the San Pedro Bay to re-emphasize speed and efficiency in all operations. For Southern California to remain dominant in the nation's goods movement industry, a sharp focus on maintaining rapid, cost-effective throughput is essential and must be continuous throughout the supply chain delivery system. You know, Marianne, you've alluded to this, but in addition to efficiency, one of the big things that's confronted the industry and as a result that CITT has attempted to address over these 20 years is the environment and the relationship between the movement of goods and, and the environment. And when you started this, uh, you know, we didn't have vocabulary in our, in our lexicon now, like green ports and clean truck programs and things like that, that, that really now um, you have to talk about when you're talking about goods movement. How do you see the, the evolution of, of this as an, as an interest for the industry, and where do you think we're going with it? Well, Tom, the environmental issues and regulation or threat of regulation definitely have been the big issues for the past 10 years. And obviously, we all like clean air. We all like to live in a clean environment. But the industry had to come up with a lot of effort to address the issues in a very short time. As far as the future is concerned, I would say that zero emission and uh, reducing the carbon footprint is going to be the number one issue for the industry and for vehicle manufacturing. And for us, it's, it's going to influence the content of our programs, the research that we do. It's one of those topics that we always have to, to respond to. Um, it's been interesting to observe the role that the industry's played in all of this. And, and frankly, the leadership role that Southern California Goods Movement um, uh, has taken nationally and internationally. And we have another clip um, to demonstrate that. In Southern California, the San Pedro Bay has been successful in combating many of the environmental problems associated with rapid growth and massive goods movement operations. Clean truck initiatives, adherence to rigorous air quality standards and regulations, and efforts like Peer Pass to minimize congestion have significantly reduced the impact of diesel exhaust in the harbor community. Additionally, the use of natural gas-powered vehicles in the terminals and the electrification of docking facilities to provide power for steamships, which would otherwise be burning bunker fuel, exemplify the kinds of measures that have reinforced the commitment concerning environmental mitigation. You know, Marianne, it's fun to see these clips. Um, but I'm really excited about the future. And I know from an environmental perspective, we'll continue the work that we're doing as part of the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, which is one of those Metrans family of research, yes. research centers based at UC Davis. Um, we have the work that we're doing um, with Metro Freight, uh, which is a Volvo Center of Excellence. Of excellence, yes. And, and CITT has been involved in, um, in professional development in that area, in, in mm -hmm. the area of, of city logistics and urban freight. Um, we have exciting new partnerships that will take us into the high schools uh, through work that we're doing with the Port of Long Beach and Long Beach yeah. Unified School District. And, and our newest center is uh, based here at CITT. 
is the Southwest Transportation Workforce Center, which is a Federal Highway uh, Administration Center of Excellence, and we'll be doing lots of stuff there. Uh, Tom, I have to jump in and congratulate you for the amazing work you have been doing in this very short time that you have been taking on CITT. Oh, thank you. We've got a strong foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. CITT wouldn't exist without you and your contributions to CITT and the College of Continuing and Professional Education and Cal State Long Beach and the industry and community as a whole. So thank you, and we hope you'll stay engaged with us. We'll be lucky well, to do so. First, thank you for inviting me, and I will stay engaged, uh, as you mentioned, as Senior Advisor and External Liaison for CITT, and jump in wherever I'm needed. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who have been our partners on this journey over the first 20 years. We hope you'll stay with us for the exciting 20 years to come. I'm Tom O'Brien. Executive Director of the Center for International Trade and Transportation at California State University, Long Beach. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. That was, that was really tremendous. I enjoyed that very much. And I even got a sweet preview of that, and I was still engrossed watching the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> my role today as uh, the economist talking to you guys again is to bring some perspective um, to trade, transportation, and logistics in Southern California. Um, and the cross-cutting issues that we've lived through and we've all experienced over the last 20 years have been examined, by, as the video said, um, by all these uh, various town halls. Um, but forward-looking, where are we going, where are we today in terms of the, the issues and the factors that affect the success of the port community and trade and logistics in the region? And my perspective on this starts with the biggest picture, and then I'm going to take it down to some, some specific issues. And then after that, we're going to um, do some Q&A with a panel that we're going to bring up. Um, but before that, we've also got some video clips for some retrospective. But let, let's get going with um, the start of this. Make sure I got my pointer on here. All right, here we go. Aha. Hope you can all see this. Um, <clears throat> From a perspective of that, what does this do for the community, what does it do for the region, you know, ultimately, I view this as it's quality of life. It's the living wage jobs that, that come with the region being the top U.S. trade gateway. Um, it's really the hemispheric gateway, um, a position that's been won based not just on the natural geography of position vis-a-vis -vis the Pacific Ocean and a, and a deep harbor, um, but the performance, the performance collectively of everybody that's a participant in the community, from the labor on the docks to the management to the decision makers and businesses and the government agencies that have supported it and, and in some cases um, at least tried to stay out of the way of the success of the community um, that's become so important uh, to the region. Now in the video we heard an estimate of, of one in seven jobs. I think my, my most recent estimate, depending upon how you define it, is about one in eight jobs in Southern California are trade and transportation related. That is an enormous number of, of jobs um, in this economy and this society, given how large this area is uh, collectively um, in the country, um, to be tied to trade. So that there, and there's an enormous number of the people that are engaged in trade that perhaps don't see them that way. They think that, well, I'm in warehousing or I'm in distribution or I'm in a particular trade service. But the, in the totality of the full definition, it's an enormously port, uh, important sector to the region. Um, and it's increasingly so because we've seen some other sectors sort of fade away. The old strength of, say, uh, military aerospace manufacturing has declined. We've seen some other declines in manufacturing in the region. So it's become even more important for the trade and logistics and transportation sector uh, to play the role that it's been able to, to contribute um, in, in, the, in the economy. And it's not just the ports itself. It reaches all the way into the Inland Empire. It's the distribution warehousing space. And um, all of this has made collectively this region the number one target, which is the flip side of this, for the rest of the country who looks to grow in these areas. When any economic development agent or a planner or a, a politician in another state says, we want to take more jobs in the trade sector, it's a growing sector, there's potential there, who do they look at as the potential to take it away from? <clears throat> it's right here in Southern California. <clears throat> Excuse me, I think um, <clears throat> those have been the you know, the target for a number of years, and it's something that, that continues, and we're even seeing that perhaps even at the federal level. Um, but, and I'm going to cover this in some detail as we go through this, that there's a lot of risks to the, the traditional position of this region, and they come from the policy and they come from the competitiveness side across a number of dimensions that we're going to explore. Um, if we look first at the economy, um, 
The trade outlook itself is driven by goods demand. Um, why does anybody move any freight around? It's because somebody wants something to be moved to another location from where it starts. Um, and that means ultimately it's the strength of the economy which drives all that demand that matters. So as an economist, the first fundamental is what is the health of the economy? Do the households, do the businesses have the strength, the financial wherewithal to want to make purchases and make those purchases internationally so that it trades across a border? And where we are right now, looking on now coming into eight years since the Great Recession, um, is a world of, of weak growth, where the forecast in the near term is continued weak growth. Uh, we see problems that are in overseas trade partner regions like in Europe, with the United Kingdom pulling out of the European Union and, and separating their economy, uh, providing a drag in Europe. China has a whole host of problems structurally and in their economy in terms of how they evolve forwards to shift away from export and investment-led growth um, as they have an aging population and some demographic challenges. Um, there's other developing economies that are going to be a drag on the world because of mismanagement, countries like Venezuela and, and, and some others in the, in the world that are in, in dire straits in terms of managing their own economy, such that we have a growth forecast of about 3.4%. Why is that relevant? That's ultimately the demand for the trade potential that we see. And the forecast is actually one that's an improvement over last year. We just saw some revised numbers come out for the, the U.S. economy last year of growth of about 1.6%. That's pretty slow growth compared to what we were enjoying, say, a decade ago, year after year. And the challenge for the economy and for, for the potential for jobs and our standard of living is to improve that. How do we get our potential achieved? How do we get closer to the potential that this economy has for faster growth um, and takes, take advantage of the opportunities where they are? One of the places where there's most substantial opportunity for the U.S. economy to grow is our trade partners in the emerging markets that are growing faster. It's not just China, but other countries like India, or, which has actually suffered recently some setbacks. Um, but the large majority of the world population, about 90% of it, is now outside the United States. If we're going to grow this economy, we've got to focus on trade, and that means exports and imports, trading with those trade partners in those stronger and growing economies outside the United States. We're still in a situation globally where we have overcapacity and slack resources. Um, that's dampened the rebound in commodity prices that are important to countries that are uh, commodity exporters primarily. And there remain some downside risks associated with that because um, there's uncertainties around trade policy and, and just the example of the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Treaty that, to kick off the Trump administration. There's a lot of risk ahead coming outside of the beltway that may impede and, and put at risk and jeopardize a lot of this economic security that's been tied to trade for so long. So let's break up the world a little bit regionally and look at where the potential comes from. I just mentioned the emerging markets. Bear with me as I take you through this. This is the world split up into eight regions. And for each of those regions, starting with our NAFTA trade partners, the US, Canada, and Mexico on the left, we have the other Americas, which is the rest of the hemisphere, our traditional trading partners in Western Europe, then Central and Eastern Europe as emerging Europe, and then um, the Mideast and North Africa, and then Sub-Saharan Africa, and then our traditional old line uh, trans-Pacific trade partner, the developed economy, the large economy of Japan, and then the rest of Asia, the entirety of greater Asia um, on the right. For each of those groupings, here graphed is um, the performance of their economy in 2016, the forecast for 2017 and individual years through 2019, and then a, an aggregate forecast all the way out to 2024, and I've circled here on the left and on the far right where we exist in our region. NAFTA is in the middle of, of these, if you will, where our, our traditional trade partners in Western Europe and Japan are seeing slower growth. They have slower population growth. They have a lot more impediments to being able to, to uh, resuscitate their economies. In some cases, they actually have declining populations like we see in Japan or Italy. Um, and yet the growth in NAFTA is not as strong as we see, say, as potentially there in Latin America or in parts of Africa, let alone any parts of the biggest economies with the fastest growth still in Asia. Now, I, I could add that the growth rates here in Asia that I have in this forecast, if I compared those to, say, five or six years ago, are lower. There's actually been a slowdown in growth, but a slowdown from, say, 8 or 9 percent to 6 or 7 percent is still tremendously rapid growth on a compound basis compared to what we're achieving in the United States. The point of that is each of these regions represents a trade lane or a potential trade lane with the United States in terms of sources of goods that we import or customers for the goods that we would export. And the nature and the relative forecasts 
of the just geographic distribution of this economic growth says where the trade is likely to be in the future. And for Southern California, the takeaway that's most important in this is that it still remains a trans-Pacific dominated world where the greatest potential growth is with Asia. That's where the, the biggest economy portion of the world is going to be and where the trade potential to grow is, which is a tremendous benefit that's inherent in what um, Southern California faces going, going forwards. Now, there's been a talk to the end of globalization or the desire for that to happen. And I reached back to a, another economist out of the UK named Martin Stopford, who's been tracking this for longer than I've been alive, I think. This is the 50-year view of global sea trade. This is everything that moves on the water, not just container trade. This is iron ore and crude oil, everything that moves in ships, looking back over 50 years. And this is measured in tonnage terms, so not value of trade. This is the actual physical weight of commodities moving. And you can see in that red line, this is a very, very long-term trend over a very long decades of growth of the world economy being expressed as increases in world sea trade. And even though you can see in 2008, 2009 there, we actually had an absolute dip. We had an absolute drop in the volume of trade in the Great Recession. It's since come back and set new records year after year, and we're still seeing growth. So that's the, the, the really big picture in terms of the potential and the long-term trend, but I want to focus in a little bit more on the recent past and where we are now. What we've seen in the last few years since that Great Recession, which you can see the dip in the line there in 2009 where we actually had shrinking world trade and calamity around the port sector around the world, we had one year of a sharp rebound from pent up demand in 2010, and since then growth has been slow and in fact sl gradually slowing. And there's a number of reasons for that, but perhaps most importantly from the perspective of Southern California is we've actually seen some maturation of supply chains. In some cases, the potential to take advantage of globalization in the future compared to the past is somewhat diminished. In other words, we're already trading with trade partners, so the potential to say double or triple it in a year has gone away, but there's still growth. We're still seeing growth here of several percentage points. And that decline is still such that it's, it's greater than um, the growth in the economy as a whole. There's another factor at work on sea trade, which is the, the, the divergence for the first time in decades between resource commodities tied to energy and economic growth, where economies are becoming more efficient through the use of technology and alternative fuels so that the, the, the huge volumes of things like crude oil and coal moving on the waters are starting to grow at slower rates than the economies that they've been feeding in the past, which is another factor that's a long-term trend that we don't expect to see be reduced. So let's turn to the U.S. and specifically the, the West versus the East Coast. How is this market share competition playing out specifically for Southern California in the context of greater trade, trade dynamics in the country? The, the, the Southern California market has been the largest portion of the West Coast. This perspective is one of the coast as a whole. This is the entirety of the West Coast versus the entirety of the East and the Gulf Coast as competitors uh, measured as the percentage of import TEUs, the, the, the head haul volumes that most of the carriers are concerned with and many of the ports are focused on because of the trade imbalance in container trade, where we've seen this long, slow decline Shifting into the East Coast, where you've had uh, more um, options of use of trade through the Suez and the Panama Canal, especially with the opening um, last year of the expanded Panama Canal, but with a decade of anticipation of that happening and decisions being made with regard to uh, supply chains and distribution patterns reflected in that, and some of the productivity challenges and capacity challenges that have been faced sometimes here in Southern California. And the real takeaway is the last two or three years here where we've actually seen somewhat of a stabilization. Now, if we look at this quarterly, there's still perturbations up and down. But in an annual frequency, this long, slow decline of a percentage point or part of a percentage point a year going back to the beginning of the last decade has really at least been stymied for the time being. And it's potential with some of the, the vessel supply side and some other factors that that decline that we saw for several years will, will have been stopped. Now, it doesn't guarantee that that trade's going to come into the ports of LA or Long Beach. It may be that some of that ends up in Prince Rupert or Vancouver or in Oakland or another port on the West Coast. But at least collectively, the bias is still going to be towards this market first. Now, speaking of the container shipping industry, we'd already alluded to the, the collapse of Hanjin and what, that's mean, what the, that means for the sector. We're about to jump forward this weekend into a new world of three consolidated alliances. It's hard to imagine that this collection of carriers and these market shares, even just a few years ago, would have consolidated as quickly as they have, and, and especially in the ways that they have, 
um, trying to form new service strings with new alliances, with new use of terminals, and all the consequences that that has for the industry. Arrived at out of desperation from the management and the owners of these companies ordering too many ships too soon, and getting ahead of the trade growth so that they've been losing massive amounts of money since 2010 collectively, that have really forced them and forced their hand in terms of this consolidation, with maybe more to come. It doesn't mean this is by any means the end of it, what we've seen recently. And it's not even sure that the three alliances we're about to jump forwards into are going to still be around in you know, next year even, maybe, um, given the pressures that still exist on the industry. Um, ultimately, the challenge in the container market for these operators and for those that, that work with them is to try to right the supply demand imbalance that exists at the global level in the, in the difference between uh, the shipping fleet capacity and, and the trade growth demand, which has led to these low rates that are unsustainable and the bankruptcy of Hanjin. So let's turn to some other factors that, that, that we really need to address in terms of their effect on trade. So it's not just about trade demand. There are other factors that affect the success and the competitiveness of this region, affect the quality of life for the residents of this region. And most importantly, we've already talked about this in the video quite a bit, the environmental conditions and the mitigation and regulation um, that affect the, the quality of life for the workers in the community and also are affecting the ability of this region to compete with other uh, trade, trade gateways that are competing for business. No question that this region has achieved remarkable improvements in port and trade related emissions. Um, you know, 80% reductions in, in uh, diesel particulate matter and, and even reductions in greenhouse gases, which sometimes I think gets ignored across a baseline of, say, 10 years ago. But we're living in a situation where that's sort of taken now for granted and it's not viewed as enough. Um, much more is being asked of the port and trade community for further reductions in environmental footprint and impacts. And these reductions are being um, described in terms of what's being put forth under the third generation of the, the Clean Air Action Plan. And now just very recently in the news, what CARB has done with this proposal or this introduction of regulations on individual facility caps on emissions um, that you don't find in other, other uh, potential gateways or, or gateway regions around the continent to the same degree. Um, you know, the, this Clean Air Action Plan moves from just the, what we've been doing for 10 years of, you know, exhaust after treatment and cleaner fuels and speed reductions, all these very significant and substantial measures to yet another whole stage of, of much more comprehensive complete electrification and zero emissions that all bring enormous new challenges, especially on the financial side in terms of how this all gets paid for. And ultimately, what this means for the trade community is that if the, the, the Southern California costs that are tied to this environmental mitigation diverge in greater degree than they have from other trade gateways, we could see that long discussed potential further um, diversion of discretionary cargo away to other competitors and the loss of the associated business and jobs for the region. Now, there's an offsetting dimension to this that, that may matter, and we'll have to see how it plays out. There's um, the potential for, um, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. I've got to go back to it. All right. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to say, okay, here we go. The pace of the adoption of technology has been accelerating broadly across the economy, and there's no shortage of pressures to have that happen across transportation and logistics. Um, there are a lot of companies that are investing enormous amounts of money in it, and it's not even just from the traditional players. We've heard a lot about what companies like Google are doing in the transportation space, and who knows exactly where that leads ultimately. But one thing is sure is that the Silicon Valley pace of business change and revolution and investment is very different from the conventional old line freight transportation um, paradigm, and that, that, that every year becomes more and more important in terms of the potential for change and the pace of change. Um, both negatively and positively in terms of those repercussions in trade and transportation. Um, Technology is bringing greater connectivity. It's bringing visibility to supply chains long desired by those that participate in them. Um, it has provided already some tremendous gains in productivity, some, at least the potential for enormously improved collaborative planning. Um, and better use of available system capacity, which can substitute for hard investments in infrastructure capacity and even workforce in some cases. Um, there are other benefits like reliability and safety. Um, that are other reasons that people are investing in technology, even apart from the, the economic benefits. But very importantly, as we look forward to automation and, and the dreams of some of the designers and inventors of some of the technologies, 
there's some real threats to the existing pattern and the cohesiveness of the trade community in terms of the workforce. What do we do about logistics jobs and skills that are really made obsolete or made no longer affordable by the potential that the technology can bring to the table? especially if we don't address it in terms of looking forwards on the both part of labor and management in terms of how do we ad adapt our workforce going forwards. How do we have the training and education to capitalize on the potential for technology to actually capture business and, and be leaders of in Southern California, like happened decades ago when we had mechani mechanization on the West Coast and labor worked with management to have containerization take hold on the West Coast and lead these ports to take market share away from other competitors in the past. That succeeded before and it can see it can succeed again if the community comes together to address the potential and take advantage of it. Okay, let's move on to regulations. There is um, a lot of potential that, that we're facing. I've got to make sure I'm, I'm still going ahead of myself here on one slide. Um, Regulations affect productivity broadly, reliability and capacity and competitiveness across all the dimensions. And we think of, well, the, the freight transportation system in, in the economy was deregulated back in the 1980s and all of that's over. Well, in fact, that was just a major step forwards in terms of the paradigm for how we regulate transportation. But the shift quickly came towards uh, safety and towards environmental regulation. There is still legacy um, economic regulation in many respects, especially things like um, uh, on deep sea ocean trade under the Federal Maritime Commission, um, but even to the some degree on the class one railroads and other ways you may not realize it. But the, the overall effect of regulation on the trade and transportation sector in this region of the country is a hybrid. It comes from the federal government, it comes from the state government in Sacramento, it comes from local levels, even down to the level of individual communities and cities doing truck regulations that affect the network performance at a very suboptimal level potentially. All of these have costs and from the perspective of the competitiveness, um, that's the, that is the, the evaluation that's needed in the perspective on enforcing and, and adopting regulations is to keep in mind that they have real costs and repercussions of adopting them where people can lose their jobs. We can suffer as an economy if we don't take the, the cost of regulations into uh, account when we're making the estimates. Now, as an economist, we think it's a good idea to have regulations that, that uh, deal with externalities, that deal with those impacts that you don't actually pay for directly, traditionally, to actually make sure that those are taken into consideration. But th the way regulation works is um, it has the potential to disrupt um, the business patterns in a way that we actually damage the economy and therefore damage our quality of life if we actually see incomes go down and unemployment go up in a region as a consequence. Now, there, the regulations are leading to lots of things that we can predict going forwards. There's, there's programs already in place with adoption dates and deadlines that we know are going to take effect that affect vessel operations, port terminal operations, truck driver working conditions, trucking operations, railroads. All of these are affected by regulations that are either in place, have already been adopted, are working their way through the rulemaking process, or being proposed today, or in some cases litigated, um, or still haven't even come out of the, the minds of the staffers in Sacramento or in Washington, D.C. The Competitiveness of the region can be affected by all of these, and where they're not matched by the other uh, port competitor regions in the country, that can put this region at a disadvantage. And that's where, in the past, this region has been able to things such as the Clean Air Action Plan to actually show leadership and to show innovation in, in adopting regulations in a way that benefits the community and doesn't give up the competitiveness of the region versus others, and you actually see adoption by competitors over time that are copying the regulations and, and the, um, the methods that are adopted here to deal with these externalities that affect everybody in society. So let me go back finally to this changing policy environment. The downside risks and the uncertainty around trade and transportation are the most I've seen in 30 years in my whole career right now because we don't really know yet what's going to come out of Congress and the, and the Trump administration. Um, we don't have detailed policy proposals that match what we've seen in other administrations in the past. And in some ways, we don't really even know what to say the Republicans in the House or, the, or what's going to happen in the Senate in terms of supporting administration proposals. And it could go in different directions in terms of extremes of both new trade barriers that could impede trade, even with the specter of a global trade war with retaliation from trade partners, to the other extreme where we don't take such drastic trade measures that would impede trade but invest enormously in infrastructure that could facilitate trade and, and make us more productive and take more advantage of the access to trade gateways. And those two Two extremes now seem both possible at the same time until we see more out of Washington. And unfortunately for supply chains, that's a problem, not just in terms of the unknown, but it, it's, it's 
actually stymieing some of the decisions that need to be made because of the degree of uncertainty. Supply chains resist uncertainty, they don't like unreliability, and when they're faced with greater uncertainty, decisions get delayed and investments get delayed. And that means some of the advantage, the gains that could be, could be captured from investments in trade are not made, and we're not capturing them, and the economy's not benefiting. We're not achieving our potential because we're waiting for decisions to be made about policy. So that ends my remarks. Um, we've got um, a question and answer session coming up, but we're gonna move to um, some video clips as a retrospective to see how we've done in the past. We've got three video clips that are taken from previous town halls, and we're gonna look back a little bit to see how we've done, and that'll lead to some of the questions, and then we're gonna bring up the panel after we show these video clips. The demand of economies, the growth in populations, the desire for success amongst families and businesses will all drive us back eventually to growth again. And we return to that growth path so that once again we'll see the growth in trade. Sound familiar? <laughs> need to solve the uncertainty, we need to get our infrastructure up, we need to run these trucks better and smarter and, and make sure that our system is running efficiently so we can keep these warehouses full and see if we can get development back on track. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more. I've time. spent about a decade working for one port authority or the other and one of the things I like to characterize the relationships between the ports uh, is we're kind of like siblings. You know, we like to poke each other in the eye, we steal each other's people and customers and cargo. Um, but when threats come to the family, um, we have had a history of banding together and doing stuff together uh, to help out. And that goes back. All right, very good. Well, I want to invite all the panel up. And we're going to um, bring the lights up, and then we're going to start a, a Q&A. So thank you. Rather than take the time to introduce one of, each one of our, our esteemed panelists here, I remind you that in the programs that you were given when you came in are the bios for each of these speakers. And, um, when, I, when each of the speakers speaks for the first time, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly. Um, and I think we're just about all set. So I have a set of questions that, that I'm going to ask first that are geared off of the, the, the three clips that we've just seen. Um, with retrospective across um, you know, many dimensions of the community represented by the panel. But the first, the first question, thinking back to what I was saying coming out of the Great Recession in 2009, is today, is growth in our local trade sector still inevitable, uh, given the uncertainty in Washington and changes in global trading patterns? You know, really fundamentally, what's changed here? Uh, what's different now than in 2009? Is that me? Yeah. Me? Oh, uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, <laughs> but I am now. Thank you. Uh, well, again, thank you for the invitation here tonight. Uh, did you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, just, just say briefly here, Patrick. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, Patrick O'Donnell represents the 70th Assembly District. That's your person in Sacramento, elected to represent you in Sacramento. I just followed Bonnie Lowenthal, who's out there somewhere. Uh, I represent Long Beach, uh, Signal Hill, San Pedro, taking both ports, uh, Catalina Island. So I really am the voice of the ports in Sacramento. When people in, in Sacramento talk about transportation, they're always talking about moving people. I'm talking about moving containers. Uh, I, I also sit as the uh, chair of the select committee on, on, uh, on ports and, and goods movement. Uh, so quickly, back to the question, um, which I don't even remember. Well, it's what's <laughs> I think I have it here. It, it's so what's, what's, you know, where are we now compared to 2009? Coming out of the Great Recession, are, are we still in a position where the uncertainty that we face, you know, is, is growth here in our local trade sector inevitable? Are, are we still guaranteed to have growth in trade here? Yeah, well, I think part of the question, too, is about Washington. I'm going to take Washington off the table because that's an unknown, and I think the Republicans are going to uh, block anything the president <laughs> does on the, on, the, on the trade front. So really, to me, that's kind of off the table. Uh, you know, that sounds good, but we all know in this room it's not probably practical policy what he's proposed. So I'll just talk about uh, what's going on in our area. Uh, is growth inevitable? I think yes, it is. I think for two reasons. Uh, 
Uh, number one, we just look at this region geographically. We're situated well. We have some decent infrastructure, not enough for sure. Uh, and uh, we have the base, the consumer base in this area. Uh, but we do have challenges for sure. And I can even read them because I made a list on the plane on the way down. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to read them. Yeah. Uh, the price of the container is in flux and down. We know that. Consolidation, realignment of the shipping and terminal industry. Bigger ships as well. More cooperation amongst the shippers, alliances, ports uh, from other states trying to poach our, 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 our cargo. Uh, the regulatory environment, CAP 3.0, AQMP through the AQMD. The container fee proposal, which was brought to me in Sacramento not too long ago, which is not a bill at this time, I believe. Uh, the sustainable freight strategy, CAP 3.0. Uh, again, and the facility cap, which was blessed by the CARB, California Air Resources uh, Board, just last Friday in kind of a, a, a quick fashion. So all those really put a strain on our goods movement. So to me, the answer is simple. We need to work together. It's been said here today. It's been done in the past. If you look at the, the Clean Trucks program, that's where we partnered together. There was some funding offered for the industry to change their ways. Uh, so they could get to the next step. It wasn't just a regulation and said, hey, truckers, you got to do this. And again, we partner with them with funding, and we need to do that across the industry. And I think there's a source of funding now. It's called cap and trade, and that is set to potentially be renewed up in Sacramento uh, this year. And I'm heavily engaged in those conversations, and when I talk, I talk about this region and the goods movement industry and partnering as we look at uh, uh, changing the industry and going greener because you've got to make green if you're going to go green. If you don't do that, it's all for naught. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Well, I, I can comment. I'm Michael Thomas. I'm with a company called Trinium Technologies. We provide software to the intermodal dray companies. And you know what we saw in the Great Recession was obviously a contraction in trade, uh, and that a lot of our customers suffered from that. But what they did at that time was they doubled down on technology. And it wasn't necessarily that they, they bought a lot of new technology, but they certainly put what they had to use much more effectively. And those efficiencies were sustained uh, after the recovery. And the momentum on that, that uh, technology implementation has, has continued. All right, Gil? I think growth is definitely inevitable, but it may be a little more modest than we've experienced in recent years. But uh, more importantly, beyond the, the overall growth, the total TEUs coming through this port, I think we really have to analyze the sub-markets that underlie that. How much of this is going to be moving by on-dock rail, near-dock rail, off-dock rail? How much is going to be transloaded into 53 boxes at some warehouse? Um, how much pure local ac import and export activity there is? And beyond that, this region is also a, a major domestic uh, hub. So there will be an awful lot of domestic commerce generating trucks and, and, and train traffic as well. So in order to plan for the future, it's not just looking at the total growth, but the subsets and how those markets are changing, because those will really determine what infrastructure is going to be needed to support them. All right. Well, let me, let me ask a question in re retrospective of, of Patty Senecal's comment that at the time in 2009, the focus that she was trying to stress was the need to get infrastructure improvements made. Uh, to improve the operations of the system, to make things more efficient. Uh, clearly, it was a, a, dominated, uh, a discussion dominated by the system performance and its capacity and the adequacy of the infrastructure to handle trade. Um, do you still see that as one of the greatest uncertainties now, or is it still really an infrastructure issue, or have we shifted into a, a, another set of challenges as being more, more dominant now? I don't know, Gil, if you want to follow up on that or something. Um, sure. I, it's definitely going to be a problem. I mean, just to put this into personal perspective, to get to this meeting today, I, I live near Santa Monica. It took me two and a half hours just to get to Long Beach to get to this meeting. Two and a half hours. And that's, that's on a daily basis this is happening. And I'm sure that Fred and the truckers and the, and the other people in the supply chain are, are facing similar congestion-related issues throughout this entire region, not just within the port area, but out in the Inland Empire. And, and so it's going to be an important issue to get these projects up and going. What's very frustrating to me is how long these infrastructure projects take to, to move off the dime. Uh, the project that I was involved with, the Alameda Corridor, took 17 years from concept to reality. And, and I thought we were doing pretty well in terms of that schedule. <laughs> but but it, it really is taking so long to get these projects going. 
I, I believe that infrastructure development has two possible paths, putting it simply. One is process-oriented, and one is product-oriented. And if process dominates, it can overwhelm, and overwhelm your schedule and overwhelm your, your project. Uh, I, we obviously have to follow processes like NEPA and CEQA rules. But if, if it dominates, again, uh, nothing really gets accomplished. We sometimes do EIRs two or three times over because the data gets old. Uh, uh, new elected officials come in with different spending priorities or new court decisions are, are taken which tell you how to do the baseline over again. So I, I think we all, as managers of infrastructure projects, need to balance this out, be more product oriented, and, and make sure that these projects get, get through. All right. Anyone else want to comment on it? Fred? Patty mentioned um, in her comments about the uh, productivity of the trucks. And in 2009, we were at the very edge of moving into the prior clean truck program. Since that time, we spent $2 billion on new clean trucks. Has the productivity of the new clean trucks, which are now obsolete, it sounds like, uh, is it the product productivity of those trucks better than it was in 2009? I dare say no. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it is not. And it's, it's both the port and it's things like you spoke to, Gil, uh, the traffic and infrastructure that we're dealing with throughout the, throughout the basin. So you know, our challenge is how do we get, how do we move the cargo out of the ports? And, and uh, of course, I've got a plan, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be up here if I didn't. But, but there's, there's so many things that we need to get done and so many barriers in our way. You know, the, to, to get cargo moving is, is key. Get it to prevent the delays in the port. Um, keeping the gates and keeping the operation going. If we're gonna have a port open, let's keep it open. Mm -hmm. Let's not close it down for breaks, for lunch, for shift change and so forth. I mean. Our trucks have to sit in the same line. Uh, are they, are they, uh, uh, we're, we're spending money on them while they're doing nothing. So we think there's a lot of things we can do there. I depend on Gil to fix the uh, traffic problems <laughs> and the other infrastructure problems on the freeways and the highways. But that's step one as far as I'm concerned. Paul? The, the truck issues on the terminals with uh, your, your turn times and everything, technology with human intervention is, is the key, but what's happening now, if you go back, like we talked about, what's the difference nine years ago or to 2009 than it is today? When you had a truck delivery system where you had, you had a human being that was helping organize the truck delivery, with you have trucks in, in line in a row and you've got, you're working against the machine, you can go through that row because you see the containers that are right there, and as a truck driver, maybe second or third in line, I'm going, oh, that, the, trend, the machine's got my can, oh, he's taking my can in the back, okay, oh, he's putting another can on top of it, oh, and another one on top of it, because he's getting the one in front. So when we had a, a, a clerk, I'm Paul Traney, local 63 president of the Marine Clerks Association, when we had a clerk per machine, you could organize those trucks and say, hey, hey, hang on, let me bring this operator up, let me bring this truck driver up, give him that can right there because the one underneath it belongs to the guy behind him. So let's organize it and move it productive. But with technology coming in, they have to pay for it, so you lose, you lose a clerk on the machine, and so now you've got technology telling the, the uh, operator, hey, the guy that's underneath you, this is his can. But it didn't, doesn't tell you that three drivers down in that same pile that you're in, the same can you're gonna bury belongs to the driver three doors down. So you're constantly moving and it's not productive. I think if we really, really want to be efficient in the ports, we have to have that human intervention along with technology to be really productive. Because all we're doing is we're, we're growing as a port, we're growing with productivity, but we're taking the human element out and we're just totally relying on technology. And I think if we do that, we're really gonna fail and we're gonna find ourselves in a box. Yeah. See, I'm just not another pretty face up here. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to the infrastructure question because I, I think uh, Gil is on to something with the idea of process versus product. Um, and unfortunately, what I see is an increase in process mm -hmm. constantly. Yep. Um, and in particular, our desire to have full consensus to actually do anything. 
And what that means is that one entity, one group, has what we call veto power. Mm -hmm. um, and either they can stall the project forever, or so, many, so much cost gets added on to a project in order to make a deal that the money doesn't go as far as it, it could otherwise. Um, so I think actually one of our big issues is streamlining the process. Um, and I'm really glad that we have a state representative here on the panel uh, because I think we have to do something about CEQA um, and uh, try to do a better job of shrinking the timeline. So if you really think about it, if everything takes 17 to 20 years um, and you look at what our projections are for growth, I don't see growth as inevitable here because congestion acts, um, increases so much uh, the unreliability of the system, almost no matter what goes on at the ports. So I really think we need to think of the whole system and that we need to think more about how to fix the surface side and take care of some of the process problems. Can I just add to that yeah, real quickly? I, I think you're right. And when I said product oriented, I don't mean that being product oriented means you're cutting corners. It, it just means that you're going to ask the question, you're motivated to ask the question, is this delay really, really necessary? And a lot of the times, I think you're going to say, no, it's not. We've added a process. OK, that takes some time. But usually, the unnecessary delay in associated with all these processes is like two or three times the delay associated with the process itself. So let's squeeze down these, these, these milestones and, and ferret out where we can save time and money. Right. Well, let me take it back to that, that third video that we saw with Mike Christensen from Port of Long Beach, who was talking about the ports being like siblings, and, um, but banding together when under threat. And I think that extends you know, not just between Port of Long Beach and Port of Los Angeles, but broadly for the trade community. And, and let's think, you know, maybe one of the solutions to some of this is how that this network of humans that we all represent, the, the behavior and interactions between all of us who are stakeholders in this, you know, are there solutions there? And, and, the question that, that I'm thinking of here, are, have we actually learned more about the need for collaboration as we've gone through this collectively as the, the trade, transportation, logistics community versus you know, society writ large? And, um, and where has collaboration had the greatest impact? We certainly have some successes in that area. And Paul, I'm sure you can think of some right off the top of your head. Yeah, I just got done celebrating my 30th wedding anniversary, <laughs> so I know all about collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that covered. Um, <laughs> My wife's not here, is she? I don't see her. All right, I'm good for another year. Um, you know, I, I started down the waterfront back in, uh, in 83, and uh, I remember at a place I used to work at uh, as Steady there, we had collaboration. That was back, I want to say, in 2005. And what we did was we met as a, as a, a unit right before the vessel came in. So we had all three local representation. We had management, we had yard, rail, we had everybody in there. And we collaborated there to say, how are we going to work this festival? Because the place that I worked with was very tight with space. We had to figure out what cargoes kind of come off. How much can the rail handle? How much rail cargo should we take off to keep them satisfied? We can get that. Well, you run a night gate. We'll run a 3 o'clock hoot gate. And we'll get that cargo out. We'll reuse that space in the morning. And that's how we utilize our space in the yard. Because space in the yard is, is that's, that's another problem, especially when we get into the um, uh, it's on, after this weekend when we have different partners and we've got to store their containers on those facilities, that's going to, that's, that's another, that's going to take a lot of collaboration. Right. So, um, but let's, let's talk about last year when the Ben Franklin came in, right? There was a lot of collaboration when the Ben Franklin came into to LA and then again came into Long Beach. The terminals got all three locals together and says, we've got this enormous vessel coming in, largest one ever is coming into our terminal. How are we going to unload this vessel and be productive on it? That was great collaboration, and it worked well. It worked really, really well, and it did, very, it did very good in both Long Beach and LA. So most recently, earlier this month, over at TTI, which they've had a lot of bad press with the Hanjin bankruptcy, so they were able to hold their head up high on this particular incident, where they had the, I think the vessel's name was the Avora, and they worked nine container cranes on it, and they did the record-breaking 2,461 moves on it, which is the most ever, whether it's automated or non-automated, it's the most ever that's been done. Nine gangs, 2,461 cans in one shift. That's a lot. That is a lot. You can imagine, visualize all that, that truck traffic going everywhere. But it was collaboration. The yard was set up for it. The yard was set up for the, the prior to the vessel coming in. Rail was set up. 
vessel planning, yard planning, rail planning, management, everybody, local 94, local 13, local 63 collaborated and they were able to say, hey, look what we did. We, we did, look what we did. And we need to get back to that, especially as the port grows. You, you, we just have to. If, you're gonna be, if we're gonna be successful, we, we have to collaborate. We need to be prepared. But it's a shame that it's when the Ben Franklin comes in or these, you know, these, these big vessels that come in, then we wanna say, hey, let's get together. But we need to collaborate all the time, all the time. Otherwise, again, we're just gonna find ourselves in a predicament that we're not gonna be able to get out and it's gonna be non-productive for the supply chain, efficiencies, getting trucks in and out. It's gonna be a problem. Yeah, that, so I started at the port in 2005, and, and at that time we had a pretty terrible relationship with our local communities. We had some projects on the, the LA side of the harbor and on the Long Beach side of the harbor that we couldn't get through the environmental review process. There was a lawsuit on the LA side, we had a project that was held up in the process, and so it really was a time that we needed to, both ports independently, were going back and rethinking what did we need to do to be able to move forward so that we could continue to build the infrastructure that we needed for the ports and continue to move goods. And so we, traditional competitors, we decided to work together. And so the environmental groups at both ports really sat down and thought about, okay, how do we address this? And how can we bring in the regulatory agencies that, that we didn't have those strong relationships with them at the time either? How do we all work together and collectively come up with different things that we can do to address these problems so we can move forward? And we reached out to the industry albeit probably not to the extent that folks wanted at the time. So a lot of these partnerships, I think, have been not necessarily easy partnerships from the beginning, but I think in retrospective, looking back on what we've been able to accomplish over the last 10 years, it's through working together and trying to address these challenges together that we've been able to come up with solutions and have the successes that we've been able to achieve. I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Heather Tomley. I'm Director for Environmental Planning for Port of Long Beach. So my perspective really is on what we've been able to accomplish from the environmental perspective. And I think that we would not have been able to accomplish any of it if we hadn't been working together. I'd like to add to that. Um, I feel as if, collect my name is Felicia Alexander and I work for Panel Pina and I am the Regional Sales Manager for the Consumer retail and fashion vertical. However, I really feel like we put a lot of concentration on collaboration as it relates to the service providers and the legislation piece, but there's also another component where we've expanded the conversation where you've added the component of the BCO. There have been opportunities where there has been success where you have all different components of the supply chain, and that really helps with making sure that everybody is heard and everybody's needs are met. I mean, improve, improving just how we reach out to the community is very important, but it's also the end user, those that are benefiting from our services. And I think that's extremely important, and we have seen a change within at least the past two decades that I've been in the industry. Um, yeah, uh, so we've heard from on the dock, in the port building, and the retailers. And what, where, where, where that helps me as a, a policymaker is if, you know, this whole panel is in agreement. It helps me make decisions. It helps me advocate for you at the Sacramento <coughs> level. When we have disagreements or infighting, uh, to the extent that that can be solved, worked out, and people can come forward with the suggestions, ideas, or even support for dis different initiatives at the Sacramento level, that helps me. Uh, you know, when, when I got a, you know groups that are split, it, it makes it much more difficult in my arena. And quite frankly, sometimes we get taken advantage of, or our voice isn't heard. The goods movement industry isn't heard up in Sacramento when we're not in agreement. And I give you a perfect example where I saw this work out well. We had the Maritime Symposium up in Sacramento, I don't know, six weeks ago. And all the groups were under one roof, and they were all talking the same thing. They all got that, yeah, the ports are about volume, but they're also about velocity. And that was kind of a good moment for me as a policymaker to see everybody coming together and talking, because that, that's what I need. I need talking and agreement and so we can move the football down the field. All right. Let's, let's move on to another question here. I think to, to try to leverage that perspective on the, the collaboration and working together, you know, Jen brought up this point earlier that I think um, there's con concerns. Have, have, we, have we picked the low-hanging fruit in terms of the improvements that we can make? Have, have, we, have we 
done the easy things in terms of whether it's environmental collaboration for, for mitigation issues, for dealing with our communities, for improvements to our supply chains. You know, facing the competitive pressures that we have and the continuation of all these many various issues and aspects of the local concerns, is it going to be as easy going forward, say, as it has been the last 10 years? Clearly, we thought it was a struggle at the time, but looking forwards where we are across any of these dimensions, is it going to be more difficult to do what we've done to match the performance that we've seen in terms of improving throughput capacity collaboration in the last decade going forward to the next decade? Jen, maybe you'd want to start that? Okay, I will start that one. That was my question. Um, <laughs> I, that's why it was so long, because I'm a professor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and stuff, right? um, one of the things, uh, I started as director of Metrans back in 2001. Uh, and um, so I've been to several of these things, and I've, I've um, paid, my, paid my dues sitting on the policy and steering committee and so on. Um, and I've learned a lot. And one of the things that I've observed is that there's been a tremendous increase in collaboration. And what I mean by that is more parties getting together and bigger problems being addressed over the, the time that I've been involved. Um, and I actually don't know that there are many other industries that have accomplished what this industry has accomplished. Um, so there's always the question of how far can it go um, and the reason that's a question is that as we try to do things that are more difficult, uh, the trade-offs are more difficult and it's really much harder to get agreement, right? Um, so if we are thinking about the sort of next generation of changes in port operations or the next generation in um, policies to achieve zero trucks or whatever, you know, all the many things that are on the agenda. Um, how do we go about developing a process for acknowledging trade-offs and figuring them out? So, for example, the Supply Chain Optimization Group um, did a really good job in um, addressing the congestion problems of the fall of 2015. There were several decisions that were made uh, with stakeholders together. And honestly, the, the congestion problem really was solved very quickly. Um, when it got going to sort of think about the more difficult things, like let's say a totally transparent and um, terminal-wide or port-wide, port-wide apartment system, it's not so easy. Um, why? Because we have appointment systems that are already there. Um, there, that means that I have to give up mine if I go to a common one. So there's all these sort of trade-offs that have to be made in order to go that next step. Um, the upside of all this is that technology is going to force a lot of this. Um, in, in my view, and I probably won't be here to see it, but you know, 10, 20 years out, uh, or probably even sooner, we're, we are gonna have a transparent supply chain. Um, we are going to have the data, we are going to be exchanging data, uh, even though we think it's totally impossible now. Um, but it's going to start in pieces, it's going to start in, um, in sections. Port of LA is working on something now, as I understand, you know, and there's all these other pieces. But sooner or later those pieces are going to integrate. Um, and it's going to be because it gives so much benefits in the long run. But the trade-off thing is going to be the first step to get over. Gil? And Jen, to accomplish what you've just described, uh, the industry needs to break down, to some degree, the multiple silos that exist today, where there are different cost centers for each mode and each terminal, each entity has its own individual interest in heart, at heart. And when it comes to collaborating, it means giving up potentially some information that might be propriety, that's gonna be a very difficult constraint mm -hmm. on accomplishing on what you just said. Um, in construction, there's a, a term called partnering, which uh, when I first started in the Alameda Corridor, I thought it was a kind of a simplistic concept, but it seems to work. It's a one-page document that says the, con the contractors, the engineers, and all, everybody involved in that particular project 
sign a simple agreement that they will collaborate and, and try to avoid litigation and disputes and, 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 um, and claims. It doesn't always work, obviously, but it does help a, a set a, um, an attitude of cooperation and collaboration from the very beginning. Something like that needs to be transferred to goods movement industry in, in general. Heather, maybe I could ask from the port's perspective, how does the, the industry, how do we continue to maintain sort of that, that social license to operate, you know, the, the public acceptance of, of what the business is of the industry faced with all the challenges and, and the, you know, the negative implications and impacts that we have on society through, you know, traffic or emissions or whatever. <laughs> Right. I, th I mean, I think that we're still, we've come really far in the last decade, but we still have a long way to go. And I think that um, there are a lot of people out there watching what we do and making sure that we're continuing to move the ball forward and continuing to address the, the impacts that we're having from the environmental perspective, from the traffic perspective, and, and other things. And we need to make sure that we're, we're continuing to look at ways that we can make those improvements, but to do it in a sustainable way. We have to be thinking about the, the costs that are associated with moving um, forward with new technologies. What kind of timeline makes sense for us to be able to implement those, but also at the same time making sure that we're moving forward as quickly as we can to address the concerns of the community and the, the needs for the, the region. So. I think that, that really what we need to be doing is just keeping, keeping ourselves focused on looking for where there's areas for improvement, but doing it in a sustainable way so that the industry can bear it and we can continue to make the progress and continue to move the goods through this, through this gateway. Thank you. I'm trying to leverage off of that question about the technology. If we look at the private sector in terms of adoption of technology, uh, Felicia, maybe I could ask you from the you know beneficial cargo owner supply chain perspective, you know how is that how is that technology allowing you to participate better or be engaged in the collaboration or to also help to assist in that you know maintaining the the operations and the functioning of the industry? Right. Thank you. Um, well, from a service provider side, what I have noticed is that the customers really um, they rely heavily on technology and really comes from three different vantage points, and the benefit from it is visibility within the organization. Um, it allows them to operate from an overall supply chain management perspective where there's no longer silos. So when I started, transportation was just that. It was a transportation department. And the expansion has gone beyond just working with the transportation department or maybe the traffic manager to the point where you're working with the chief operations officer, the chief procurement officer, to chief technology officer, to chief tra transportation officer. So the reason for that is because supply chain hits each one of those verticals, as we all know, in terms of just how they manage their, their business operation. And it's important because at the end of the day, they have to meet their needs and requirements, and it's their customers if they have products that they're moving, or um, their stockholders if they're a public company. We have also noticed that with um, how our industry has evolved, that we see more and more CEOs that are focusing more on their supply chain. So you, when you read the annual reports, you're seeing more of the language about how they manage their supply chain and how it impacts their bottom line. And it all feeds into just how they, how they manage the visibility of all of their services. So technology is extremely important. But in the same token, it's created a threat in our marketplace because now we're having to change as quickly as technology changes. So um, there, when I first started in the 90s, um, Global consolidation services was important, origin management, vendor management, to the point where now it's, um, the conversation has changed. Um, customers are talking about their order management. They're talking about their e-commerce facilities and what it means to meet their customer requirements. And they have really been threatened by a lot of these companies, such as Amazon, or just what we like to say is the whole Uberization of freight, how to manage it. So while it's good, it's putting a lot of um, people at risk in terms of how they think. So making them think outside the box and elevate their game. Fred, I want to follow up. I think we need to bring this back a little bit with the, you know, the poor trucking industry that holds this all together. You know, the glue that, that connects all the modes, the facilities, the properties, the customers, the, the stakeholders. 
You know, we've just talked about a number of challenges, and, and specifically from the Port Trucking perspective, what do you see as the solutions that are going to help us continue going forward? Well, I think, uh, first of all, let me segue back to what we were talking about in collaboration. What we've seen in the last several years is a tremendous amount of, of cooperation between the port trucking industry and the terminals the, the, uh, and the port, uh, cooperation that we never saw in prior years, where people are actually sitting down to solve problems. Uh, aside from the problems I've already talked about, one of, the, one of the other challenges we are having today is a segue that we are making away from uh, steamship line provided chassis to that which is uh, no holds barred uh, provided. And, uh, and so, so there's no real direction there except there are barriers to taking commercially viable directions. Um, that sounds convoluted. So let me explain. <laughs> <laughs> the steamship lines a few years ago just said, we're not gonna be in the chassis business anymore. We're gonna diverse divulge ourselves or divert, whatever that word is, get away from owning <laughs> chassis. We're selling the, the things. And trucker, you're gonna have to come in with your own chassis. And we said, and, they, and the world said, oh, the truckers can't afford to buy truck chassis. So, so we sat back and said, okay, we'll, play, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. And as it did, uh, we had some challenges and the pool of pools was created and that was awesome. It really did solve some problems, it enabled uh, chassis to be treated as generic. And today, uh, you know, as it, as it evolves, we found the steamship lines were just kidding when they said they were getting out of the chassis business. <laughs> <laughs> because that becomes a sales tool if you have, troubles, if you have trouble sell, closing the deal with major retailer ABC or XYZ or whichever one, you say, oh, well, I can't drop my price because the world's gonna know I charge you X amount but I'm gonna throw in free chassis under the table. Mm. <laughs> and there they go. Mm. And so I, as a trucker, now have to use the steamship line chassis. Okay, sounds, you know, it sounds like we just reverted to what it used to be, except on the rest of the world that didn't get that free chassis under the table or on top of the table, we end up paying whatever the market price is for a chassis, which is somewhere around 25 bucks today, uh, for a, for a 20 to 30 year old chassis. And if you are even a third grade, eld third grade mathematician, you can sit there and figure out that I can amortize a $15,000 chassis or $11,000 chassis over a couple of years and wow, that 25 bucks gets paid back really, really quick. So the trucking industry has gone out and bought a ton of them. But that becomes, and now that brought, brought on a logistics problem that when I bring in my own chassis and I go take an empty in with it and now I'm going to pick up a load for that retailer we were talking about, I either have to use my chassis and not get paid for it, doesn't sound like a good deal, or take my chassis back to the yard and go in with, and pick up their chassis. So we've got, we've got some work to do on the chassis end of it. Um, the logistics, the physical logistics of the chassis business uh, is difficult too with, with the chassis all being inside the terminals. And um, we're advocates of taking those chassis, like PCMC has done, sticking them in, in yards just outside the terminals, run by, run by the same people, uh, chassis uh, ma uh, maintenance companies that use the same labor they're using inside the terminals to maintain them out there, but have them compete. So if I go in and jump in line at, at uh, the, this one, and his line is three miles long, and you see it's gonna be forever, my driver just switches over to this one and says, ah, grab the chassis, in I go, and my truck gets in and out of the harbor quicker. So, so we think that solution is something well worth looking at. We've got a little problem finding land for it. Um, we need, we're gonna work with the ports and, and work it through that. How, how that land gets paid for, gotta work through that too. But uh, it, it's gonna take collaboration on solutions like this as we smooth our, our transportation system for the future. All right, well thank you. I think that's very insightful. I wanna shift now to the audience. You've got, uh, I'm sure, some questions you wanna ask us, either using the guidelines, that, that submitting through the cards or at the microphones. Um, and I think we're gonna start with some cards coming in from over here. 
several questions already. Good. Oh, terrific. All right. <laughs> 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 Some of which we have already All right. Okay, thank you. Ah, okay. Well, here's, here's a good question for the panel. This is sort of a fundamental question. Who is the customer? Stakeholders in the supply chain industry seem to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> That's a definitional problem. Maybe wants to take that. Up. <laughs> I just I just move the cargo. So wherever <laughs> customers are. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I think it depends on where we are in the supply chain or Excellent. where we are in a discussion. Mm -hmm. So, if you're talking about um, maybe at the waterfront to working with the trucking companies or even with the steamship line, it really depends. It really comes down to. Um, the discussion piece, because we're all somehow related. At the end of the day, we have to make sure that we're all happy, and collaboration is all about sitting at the table and establishing an understanding and agreement on the process. So it, it, it's really who's paying who. But you really should make sure that we all walk away with the general consensus and an understanding of what the needs and requirements are, because it's all about the sustain sustainability of the partnership. Anybody else want to comment on that? Well, isn't it ultimately the BCO uh, uh, beyond, beyond the, the, the individual consumer in America? Right. I mean, everybody here is buying stuff. So you're the ultimate customers, really. But, but the first uh, place is probably the BCO that has a lot of clout on where that cargo goes. Ultimately. Yeah, I, I would agree with, I mean, obviously that's the, that's the answer that we're doing this all because we're trying to move their goods through this, through this complex, but I think that also from the customer service end, we each have our own relationships and partnerships that, that we're making sure that we're enhancing as much as possible so that we can keep things moving through. And so I have, you know, customers working with the, the terminal operators on clarifying some of the requirements that we have from the environmental and same with the trucking industry, but also to the community and the environmental organizations. Right. They're customers of mine too that I need to make sure that I'm communicating with. That's more on the customer service end, but ultimately it's for moving the goods. All right, well, let's move on to another question here. We've got several more. I, there, here's one that's much more specific that maybe we can address quickly, and I know who to ask. It says, are there plans to extend the Alameda Corridor east, eastbound to the Inland Empire to help decrease local truck traffic and utilize short-haul rail? Gil, maybe you'd like to address that. Well, there is, as you know, an agency called Alameda Corridor East Construction Authority, which is not moving cargo, but they are building grade separations, overpasses or underpasses out in in the San Gabriel Valley, and then beyond the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles County, there are San Bernardino County, Riverside County are trying to build infrastructure improvements, grade separations. Um, but as far as an extension of the rail line to, to, to consolidate railroad traffic onto one rail line or another, that is not happening. The BNSF and the UP continue to use their main lines east of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and that will probably continue, um, you know, forever unless, unless there's some act of God that tells them they're going to consolidate onto one other corridor. But I don't think that's going to happen. It was considered, uh, but never went anywhere. All right. Well, let me, let me ask another question that builds on this question of consolidation and, and capacity performance. This question is, this is the only container complex perhaps in the world with 13 proprietary port terminals. Given larger ships and smaller number of alliances, do we need 13 terminals? Can the terminals collaborate for mutual benefit? Can the ports collaborate for mutual benefit? And I might add to this question, you know, we've seen examples elsewhere of, of some changes in terminal ownership and operations uh, more drastically than we've seen here, like just up in Oakland, for example. Who wants to comment about that? Um, I'll take a quick comment. I, I'll, I'll just be quick. I can take the, the Seattle-Tacoma example. I was up there, what, several months ago looking at what they did. <laughs> And they've got their alliance. Uh, I think they're still separately governed, still have their separate governing bodies, uh, but they work together. So they're not poaching each other's cargo. They partner on infrastructure. I think that's something we could look at going forward. Good example. Um, Jen? I actually think um, 
there's, there will be a lot of capacity to exploit as a result of what's going on. So um, do we need all of the terminals that we have now given the alliances and given all the things that were happening? Probably not, but um, that's, it's the way that there will be capacity for expansion in the future. There's a related question, um, which I think is a pretty straightforward one to answer, or at least in terms of one's opinion. It says, with ocean carrier consolidation, will collaboration become easier? Or will it become more difficult? And why will that, why will that be with what's going on in the industry? Any opinions? <laughs> We're in agreement. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I think there's a lot to be seen in how the alliances all shake out and what it really ends up meaning. I think, yeah, that, I think there's maybe a lot of uncertainty at this point. Yeah, maybe that's really a lot of unknowns there that still remain. Well, let's take it in another direction with a different question. This goes back to the discussions on environmental reform. Um, Jen, you'd mentioned sequel reform. There's a question here. There are many um, environmental justice groups that benefit uh, from lawsuits or settlements. How can we convince them to collaborate and give up the financial rewards for being non-participatory? <laughs> you, you sort of alluded to that in, in your um, First of all, um, I think the environmental justice community would reply that this is, these are the tools that we have to um, write <laughs> the wrongs that we see. Um, and so if you, you know, you can't, if you're going to consider including, improving my quality of life as a gain, of course that's a gain and that's of course um, what my objective is. Um, so I think where we need to go is to have a better process that allows us to somehow negotiate more effectively and avoid as many lawsuits as we have. And that's why I'm thinking that if we can develop better process through CEQA and somehow a better negotiating process, we might be able to at least um, bring down the time that it takes to get through a process and also bring down the cost of the projects that we actually end up with. I would, I would also take it maybe a little bit more fundamental, not just in the CEQA realm, but just in relationship building. Over the last decade, um, we've, we've come a long way in building relationships with the environmental justice and the, and the local community groups. And I think that we have a lot more trust. There's a lot more trust in that we're willing to make good on the things that we're promising. Ten years ago, we came out with a Clean Air Action Plan. We made a lot of promises that I don't think a lot of people actually believed that we could actually move forward with. But we did a lot of things. And we, we I mean, the trucking industry turned yeah. over in, in three really years. I mean, who would have guessed that, that we would have been able to do something like that? Ships are now plugging in. We've seen a lot of benefits, and I think that the community recognizes that. I think they're still not satisfied. They want to see more, and they want to continue to see us making improvements. But I think the fact that we've been able to make good on some of our promises have really gone a long way with building better relationships. And that's where it all begins. Yeah, very good point. All right, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the clock here, and I think we've just we've got several more questions, and we're not going to have time for them all. So I apologize for those of you that have submitted questions that we didn't get to. Um, and I want you to ask you and the audience to thank the panel here. I think this is a tremendous thing. <laughs> At this time, I'm going to turn the podium over to Marianne, who's going to take us through the next step in the program. And thank you all for your attention. So well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. This was an amazing discussion. I know we could have gone easily longer for another hour or two, if you wish. But I am so honored to present tonight the first annual Dominic Moretti Award. Um, I was reminiscing about the 20 years of CITT. And uh, 
two men stand out, and it's Dominique Moretti and Norman Fassler Katz, two individuals who cared for the industry, uh, who dedicated their career bridging gaps among the stakeholders, fostering cooperation, and facilitating dialogue. Dominique Moretti, um, as you heard earlier, uh, met with me. He was one of the founding members of the Policy and Steering Committee. And I felt from the very beginning, we have to include the ILWU. The ILWU has to be on the table, and Dominic was the man. 20 years ago, life was very different in this industry. And according to Dominic, he said CITT was in fact the first group where labor was on the table to jointly discuss industry issues. I will always remember the day I met Norman Fassler Katz. It was about 15 years ago. He just became senior consultant of the Assembly Select Committee for California Ports. <clears throat> uh, the CITT offices at that time were at the World Trade Center. And at the World Trade Center, we had a huge conference room with a big table in the middle. This is where Norman and I met. I have to tell you that I have never met with the person who wouldn't sit down with me for a conversation while they're walking around the table. Well, eventually, I adopted and I started walking myself. And I have to tell you that the brain seems to be working much better. So you could say that meeting with Norman was a moving experience on many levels. <laughs> This was, this was also the time when the L word came up more and more during our policy and steering committee meetings. It was legislation, legislature. The legislature watched the industry and the legislature got involved. And the committee agreed quickly that we ought to have some representation from the state legislature. And Norman was the man. He was eager to learn, eager to understand the industry, just like Dominic Boretti, he believed in inclusiveness and discourse not only among industry segments, but also with the community and with the elected officials. And as you've heard tonight, collaboration was the operative word, and Norman certainly was one who pushed in that direction. In fact, Norman was ready for action, and Norm's philosophy of cooperation has been evident in many initiatives that um, made an impact in the industry. For example, he spearheaded CalMITSA, which is probably the world's longest acronym. It stands for California Marine and Intermodal Transportation Systems Advisory Council. That is to say. Um, with the passion he developed and staged the California Maritime Leadership Symposium that is held yearly in Sacramento, and it is still going on. Norm truly has a unifying legacy. Besides our friendship, Norm and I have a few things in common. We both lost our spouses untimely to cancer. We both are retired, kind of. <laughs> uh, we served together on the Cal Mitzak Executive Committee and we both like to walk when we talk. Um, we also know that Dominic would be so pleased with the selection that the Policy and Steering Committee made <clears throat> with today's presentation of the annual Dominic Moretti Award to my dear friend, Norman fassler Katz. Norman, please come up. Hold with the photo for one moment because I believe we do have uh, a proclamation from Congressman Alan Lowenthal um, to present. Is uh, please come up. Uh, I would also like to ask uh, Sharon Christensen, Dominic Moretti's daughter, to come up here for that photo opportunity. Uh, together with Mike Thoreau, is is he still here with Local 94? 
and Mondo Paul's VP of the of Local 13. If you wouldn't mind coming up and we take a photo after the proclamation. Good evening, everyone. Um, we couldn't miss the opportunity to congratulate and honor Norman. So I want to read uh, the certificate of recognition. In recognition of your remarkable dedication as an advocate for California's maritime transportation industry and in honor of your significant contribution throughout your career, thank you for the legacy of service you have provided to the country. You know, when uh, Tom called me and informed me about the um, award, uh, I told Tom that he was going to experience something he's never experienced before, and that was that I was speechless. <laughs> but um, then, a couple of weeks later, I wrote Tom a note and asked him whether or not I was going, I was supposed to respond to this wonderful tribute, and he said, oh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that you do. And then I wrote him back and I said, well, is it five minutes or half an hour? <laughs> uh, and I said, I'm glad that you broke out in a sweat, because I know he did. <laughs> so I, I was prepared. I was prepared for five minutes or a half an hour. <laughs> huh? Now, because I care for all of you, it won't be the half hour. Talk. But I have to say something. I, uh, I know this sounds trite and trivial, but I really was speechless because the significance of being given an award that came from CITT, whose work I value very much, who had the name of somebody I dearly loved, uh, and to be the first recipient of the award uh, touches me beyond, beyond words. I had the opportunity before we started tonight to meet Dom's daughter and his grandson, and it was such a moment of affirmation to meet his family and to share uh, what we, the three of us, had in common, and that was this relationship with this phenomenal human being. I, uh, I live in Sacramento, but my 
heart is here in Long Beach. I lived here for 12 years, and it is a place that keeps bringing me back. And I'm truly blessed. First, I was blessed to have a boss like Alan Lowenthal who said, Norman, go. And he allowed me to go. And he allowed me to work and do this body of work that saw, saw the clear message that I had to give and wanted to give. And that was, A, that this industry, this maritime industry, is an incredible asset to the state of California and to the nation. Second, that uh, the only way that this industry was going to move forward was if, in fact, they did so together. I read a report from the Secretary of Transportation in 1999. Some of you have heard this uh, speech a hundred times, maybe more. But the first page of the report, in the executive summary, he said the maritime industry is the most fragmented, siloed uh, uh, industry in all of commerce in the United States. That was one of the most honest statements I ever read. And it, in fact, became my Bible. It was, it was the basis for everything that um, I was able to do. And that, again, is a reflection of how Dom and I came together because we both valued this industry and we knew what its potential was. I'm blessed by wonderful friends who came to join me tonight for this occasion. And I hope that now, after they sat through 20, uh, two hours of this presentation, that they will not roll their eyes or have their eyes glaze over as I talk to them about issues related to maritime and maritime transportation. Because if you haven't guessed it before, it is a passion of mine. It truly is. Because uh, I, I, I can't begin to describe, when you think about all the, the benefits, the economic benefits, that this industry brings to this state and to Southern California and to the nation as a whole, it's astounding and they don't get any respect. The ports and all of their partners reduced emissions by 80%, spent millions of dollars, and I still to this day don't believe that they ever got the credit for doing the job that they did. I'm truly blessed to have known Dom, and I, I'm sorry that there are those of you who didn't. This was a rare human being. I, uh, I saw him always as this soft-spoken, gentle giant. I, I, every time I saw him, it was such an experience, and of course, because we both agreed with each other. So that made it real easy. CITT, uh, first of all, I love that story you told about our first meeting, but I do want to tell you something. You, th you think that was hard. My first job in Long Beach, my office was a ticket office in a building. It, it had no windows. And I worked with somebody who was six foot something, and we did the same thing. In this little cubby, we walked around the office creating what we did. So uh, this was a step up for me. So, um, CITT, the Center for International Trade and Transportation, um, has been successful from the very outset of their work. And part of it is because there has been a continuity of leadership that exists in this institution that I think helps it move forward. Tom introduced Mary Ann as the institutional memory. It's absolutely right. And, and CITT benefits because you now have somebody who started this whole thing and now somebody who's taken it over and taken it on to the next level. So I think with the continuity of leadership with people like Jen 
or Mary Ann or Tom or Alex, a CITT in the town hall um, is here forever. It's an institution that won't go away. What basically it boils down to for me, and I, I'm going to, to wrap it up, but what it boils down to for me is um, we have an opportunity in this area and in this industry to both be responsible neighbors and good citizens in carving out um, an important role for tens of thousands of people who have valuable, good jobs. And finally, I want to say to all of you uh, and to CITT, from the, truly from the bottom of my heart, I am so honored and humbled to be given this award to Dom's family. The treat of tonight for me was meeting you both, and um, I will value that for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norm. Norm, I want you to know that I was prepared as well. If you did go on for a half hour as opposed to five minutes, I should tell you, the only thing that Norm has a passion for greater than the maritime industry is tequila. So I was going to wave this from the back of the room to tell him to get off the stage. I didn't have to do that, luckily. Thank you. Well, and, and besides that, you also have great taste in tequila. No, Norm, I also want to let you know that we do have a, a, a certificate from uh, Assemblymember Patrick O'Donnell as well that we'll be sharing with you. Yes, I also love the fact that he gave recognition to yeah. the Thank, Thank you. Well, this will, uh, this will conclude our, our town hall. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Paul and to our entire panel of distinguished guests for your expertise. I do want to apologize to Mike Trudeau of Local 94. I reassigned you, I think, when I was stumbling over my, uh, my notes and put you into the wrong local. My, so my apologies. I'll do that again. Um, uh, and for all of our panelists, I want to let you know on your way out, we do have a uh, commemorative plaque honoring your, your participation in the 20th anniversary. So please make sure you get that on the way out. Um, tonight's Proceedings will be captured in a summary report available to all on our website. We'll take a look at the questions that we weren't able to address and summarize those and try to get some, uh, try to build that into the, the summary as well. And we're, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, if you wish for a copy of the video, please go to the CITT website and, or contact us. Thank you again to Dave Kelly um, and the AMP team for putting it all together. We're very interested in your comments on tonight's program. There's a QR code on page six uh, with a link to a brief survey that helps us gauge your interest in future town hall topics. Um, once again, we owe a great deal of gratitude to many, many people who dedicated time and effort and money to make this uh, night happen. Thank you first to Alex Traver, our talented event coordinator and her amazing team, including Royce de Rivera and Kylie Shahar. Um, I also want to thank our entire team at CITT, including the research assistants who serve under the, the direction of Tyler Reeb. We really have an amazing group of students. Uh, Sidra Shah spent a lot of time reviewing the old archives to pull out quotes and find good clips. Um, and we also had assistance both in the office and tonight um, by Kevin Argetta Flores, Shivangi Sharma, John Ho, and Miles Winston. So thank you to all of our team. Um, I want to mention again that today's event is hosted by CITT, the College of Continuing and Professional Education, and the Metrans Transportation Center, and our generous financial contributions by Watson Land Company, BNSF Railway, the LA Customs Brokers and Freight Forwarders Association, and the Metrans Core Sponsors and Associates, USDOT and Caltrans, the ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles, SCAG, LA Metro, Aerospace, Ceres, Majestic Realty, Foothill Transit, and the ILWU. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming tonight and for being part of CITT for these past 20 years. Um, I hope you found the information of value, and we hope to see you again at next year's event. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.